I, for one, welcome. If our robot overlords are listening to this podcast, I, for one, welcome you. Thank you. So I'm interested. Did you have to rewrite any of the book with generative AI in mind? Or did you just nail it and say, oh, I got it right. Generative AI fits in perfect. Oh, uh, no. I, I don't know how Wiley didn't you know, send somebody out here with a baseball bat to take me out. Progress was moving so fast. I had to write a book as if I was writing it in July, even though I was writing it back in March. And it was a tremendous challenge to put things in so that when it released, it wasn't obsolete. It's interesting to think about when people get replaced. What are the factors that come into play? We're going to realize that we have to differentiate ourselves from some of the lazier tasks that we've gotten used to doing. We've been focusing on the algorithm for so long, we forgot the real big deal is the data. And we are the best creators and the best generators of high quality data. This episode of Kensington's Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Vin Vashishta. Vin is the author of the Wiley book, From Data to Profit, its playbook for monetizing data and AI. Vin is also the founder of V Squared and built the business from one client to one of the world's oldest data and AI consulting firms. His background combines over 25 years of strategy, leadership, software engineering, and applied machine learning. Today, Vin gives us his take on the AI hype, what makes us uniquely human, and how companies can win with strategic changes around new large language models. This is a great conversation that can benefit both data leaders and data scientists alike. Enjoy. So Vin, welcome back to the Kansaneer's Neighbors podcast, the second appearance. Thanks for having me back. I mean, that's always, it's always good when you get invited back. I mean, sometimes I say some things and you're like, oh yeah, no, that was great. And never hear from people again. <laughs> well, at least from the audience last time around, they loved your takes, loved your experience. And from what I understand, there's probably been some changes in your life since the last conversation we had. So I'd love to dive in and maybe start with what's changed since we talked last. So I'm about three inches taller than I used to be. Um, obviously better looking. Uh, no, I wrote a book. Uh, the classes have taken off. I've had, we're almost about to celebrate our 3,000th thir student, which I, I, I would have been surprised if we'd have gotten 300, let alone 3,000 since launching the HROI class series. The newsletter is a lot bigger then when I started really pivoting to the strategy side of consulting, it's my primary business, almost completely out of the R&D consulting side. So uh, pretty much everything's changed, but uh, family-wise, still exactly the same. Amazing daughter, great, w great wife who puts up with some craziness with the social media. So all of it's all of it's been good, a little, little hectic, but uh, I think everybody in data right now would say it's kind of hectic right now. I agree. 100% uh, hectic is a very good descriptor. Something that is probably making things significantly more hectic has been related to AI, has been related to a lot of the changes in large language models. I know you've been talking about that quite a bit on social media. How does this all fit into the book and the consulting and, and those types of things? Has it been a sort of pivot point for you to be able to talk about these things and think strategically about them, or are they just sort of coinciding together? It's interesting that last, about end of September, beginning of October is when I felt everything switch. I went from having a very small number of calls and I was really working in a niche with companies that were forward looking, thinking about the next two to three years. How are we going to monetize data, analytics, machine learning? Then it all changed. September, October, I, I would say it went from maybe 10% of businesses being truly interested in moving forward to maybe more like a third to a half of all businesses having some ideas about going forward. And the people that reached out were different. 
it wasn't mid-level leaders or VP level. It was CXOs and CXOs outside of the techn- technology organization. That's ch- a dramatic shift in the way that companies perceive data, machine learning, data science, AI. They're calling everything generative AI. I mean, if it's if it has anything to do with data science, it's either AI or generative AI. So I think the interest is there. I think there's a lot of hype. I think the, but I've never seen a hype cycle die down this quickly. That's one of the other really unique things about what's happening today. The hype cycles typically are two years, three years. This one feels like nine months where it went from peak to now we're asking for results and looking for outcomes. And I think that's a really big change. You know, speaking of big change, I think a lot of people think the hype is related to consumers, individuals using these products. It seems like there's parallel hype with companies and business leaders focused on this. How do you feel about that hype? So it seems like you're observing that it's going down, but is it warranted? Is it not warranted? I mean, a lot of the stuff that you're posting on LinkedIn is a reality check for leaders. I think personally that the AI hype for consumers, especially with ChatGPT and these tools in everyday life is very real. I think for for companies, it is significantly more nuanced. Can you spread a little more light on that? Yeah, I think so. ChatGPT and generative AI just overall huge. They are they are going to live up to hype, just not the hype that we're throwing at it right now. And I think that's the nuance that you're talking about. Generative AI is an interface. I call it an operating system because that's a really good way to think about it. It gives us access to a lot of capabilities, functionality, knowledge graphs, a ton of things that we weren't able to easily access before. So number one, if you wanted to access, it was going to be expensive to build. Number two, there were areas where you just simply couldn't do it. It wasn't feasible. But with generative AI, LLMs, we're able now to, with a natural language interface, being able to talk, being able to ask questions, getting out of some of the lower level technical knowledge that's necessary to do really anything with data, anything with complex documents, complex functionality, complex task flows. Those are all things that generative AI enables. So we have an interface, but it's still the functionality that's on the other end. So it's disruptive, but it isn't disruptive in the way that a lot of the hype makes it out to be. It's being overextended as far as what it can do, which is making companies overlook the ridiculous value that you can get from it because they're looking at it from the paradigm of it will automate everything. It will do more from a use case standpoint than any other model has ever done before, but that's not actually the case. It enables. And when you think about it as an enabling technology, then you're thinking about it in the right paradigm. So it's going to be a game changer for businesses, but they have to begin to think about a different way of developing products, rolling products out. And they can't think of generative AI as the innovation when it comes to the products that they'll develop. It's the innovation like the operating system was. If I just dropped an operating system on you by itself, it would not be that interesting. Okay, great. I can I can get access to my PC, but I need other, I need functionality. I need this device now to do something. Now that I have access to it and it's easier, there must be something on top of it. And if you think about PCs, there was the internet, there were games, there were productivity suites, all of those. And we now had easy access to do more with our PCs than we did in the past. Same thing today. When you look at generative AI, it's going to follow the same paradigm. So generative AI, great. Now what? What's on the other end of it? When businesses think that way, they're going to really deliver some cool consumer experiences, but also B2B, huge, huge opportunities there too. So it seems like in the short term, there's disproportionate value for individuals 
because with ChatGPT, I can expand my skill set so much. I can do so many things that I couldn't do before because I was limited in my knowledge base, my understanding, my technical skills, whatever that might be. And these large language models allow me to supplement that. But on the other side, with these corporations, technically all the stuff that ChatGPT is helping them with, they already could do because they had scale through individual people. And so they're not getting as much benefit from the exact same tool as the individual is. I mean, obviously they can accrue these benefits of individuals within the organization using it, but there's what you're saying, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that there's a bigger picture on the other side of that that they're not leveraging at, or only very few companies are using uh, the, the true value of the large language models that are out there. Very true. Yes, a lot of the tools are just wrappers around ChatGPT that are overextended. Oh, we're going to do all of this stuff with your marketing team. Then you dig into it and it's just calling ChatGPT or it's just calling one of the open AI APIs and, and it's not delivering that level of functionality. But when businesses look at combining things like fine tuning and prompt engineering to enable it to give customers access to knowledge bases. So if I want to compare eight products, instead of having to use all those check boxes, now I can just query it. I could talk to an app or type it out. Here's exactly what I'm looking for. If you're shopping for PCs, great example, because you have all of these different little specifications that you might want, or you might not be a nerd and you might want to just say, hey, I don't really understand this. Here's what I want to do with it. What's the best, you know, give me the best four and I want to stay within this price range. So instead of having to check all these boxes and have all this domain knowledge, you can have it use product documentation and provide a response to you that's better than. And so you're seeing there's a user experience here. So we've already got the products page. We've already got all this documentation. Now we're creating an interface for customers that's more natural and that requires less knowledge on their part that allows for the people that know exactly what specifications they want, but also people that don't, they just know what they want to do with it. And it's those types of experiences that you can provide to customers. And internally, you can also allow for access to knowledge bases. You can allow for access to more complex analytics. Self-service tools are going to get really huge leap forward in their in the power that you're putting into people that are non-technical, non-developers' hands. But we're not seeing that yet because too many vendors are chasing the hype. I think it's really when Microsoft begins to roll out more features, they've already done a fair number of rollouts. But I think we really need to see more tangible examples of the paradigm put to work before the rest of the business world catches on. So you're going to see a whole lot of fast followers. Industry leaders right now are developing and getting ready to deploy products. So there's going to be a whole lot of companies that need to play catch up over the next probably 12 months. And so there's going to be this period of disruption coming. And if you think the hype cycle now is big, that will be even bigger because some companies are going to de deliver results. And you'll see really this stratification between mature businesses that understand the paradigm and immature businesses that don't and who've been sort of sitting on the sidelines, even though they think they are moving forward. This episode of Kenzeris Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z8 workstation. I really love that the Z workstations can come standard with Linux or WSL2, and they can be configured with the Data Science Software Stack Manager. With the Software Stack Manager, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. You know, you mentioned disruption. What does that in more tangible terms look like? We've seen, and I've been surprised by this, and you'd mentioned something, something to me offline is that it's happening different than we thought. You know, skilled jobs, you know, software engineers, data scientists, our work is getting augmented more than, for example, 
the roles that we thought would be automated relatively quickly, the truck drivers, whatever it might be. <laughs> yep. why, why is it happening like this? And what does the, the future of that disruption look like? Well, I think the part one is machine learning is still expensive. So for the unit economics to work, you have to be targeting high-end roles. To deploy a multi-million dollar solution at work that people are performing at $10 or $15 an hour, the unit economics don't work as well until you get into something that scales like Amazon. So if you have an Amazon Prime warehouse, all of a sudden you have so many people that that 25, you know, 20 to $25 an hour task is definitely worth augmenting with machine learning. But most companies don't have that same level of scale. So the unit economics at the bottom end don't work. When you look at higher end roles, see, you're seeing machine learning enter into legal. You're seeing it augment doctors and hospital staff. So you're seeing it come into higher end roles because the technology is expensive. So that's where we are today. That's really why it's targeting us. I mean, it's, it's funny because we thought <laughs> we thought we would be able to, you know, spend all of our time once AI took over, we'd be spending all of our time writing songs and doing poetry and doing all these creative tasks and making art. No, it turns out the you know, the generative models are the ones doing the art, creating the poetry, and we're bagging groceries. So there, there's this uh, period right now where the unit economics work for some use cases, but the majority of them are at the very top. The other part of how this is going to play out is we're going to realize that we have to differentiate ourselves from some of the lazier tasks that we've gotten used to doing. So those are the kinds of things that generative AI can take over. But we have to look at it as now it's freeing us up to focus on those higher end tasks. So we talk about sort of a tangible example of how generative AI can impact us. When you have complex application suites, things like AWS, trying to figure out the services that are available, even the management console itself, very, very complicated. And we have to switch between eight different screens sometimes to do our job. If you use SAP, same idea, where it is very complex to figure out where to go and what to do. With generative AI, you could just give a single box. So instead of having all of these different buttons, all of these different options, just let the user type in, here's what I want to do. And have generative AI basically be the translation layer between what the user wants to do and where you take the user to do it. So instead of having to switch between multiple applications, that's why I say it's an operating system. You've given that person a new way to interface with complexity. And in this case, it's application complexity, task complexity. So those are the bigger paradigms. And that's one tangible direction that we're going to end up going. But the other way is taking away those menial components of our jobs that don't require any independence, don't really require a whole lot of domain knowledge or domain expertise. Once we remove those, now you're challenging employees and saying, look, if you want to remain in the workforce, you have to find something that's uniquely tailored to the way a person works. And so those are more complex, more domain knowledge, more expertise centric workflows because the rest is going to be handled by something else. And if you see that in content creation, generic content, that clickbait that used to, people used to create, just pound out clickbait and get paid for it. That's not the case anymore. Generative AI can do that. Now you have to build more thoughtful, more investigative, more, more complex content in order to differentiate yourself as a person from the machine, from the model. That's what I think where we're going. It's, it's going to be interesting because we're challenged now. We have to rise and find those parts of our, our jobs that require what people are uniquely capable of. I see that phenomenon in my work every day. You know, any, I think you could, I firmly believe you could teach anyone to write a for loop. You could yeah. 
teach anyone to make a graph in Plotly or one of these things. What's more difficult to teach, and I talked about this in last week's interview with Ray, is the intuition on why you're writing the for loop, why you're graphing something in a specific way. And that is a lot of the secret sauce in any of this. That is, a, you know, probably is in the long term replaceable, but in the short medium term, it's going to be one of the later things to get replaced. I, I thought it was very interesting about the unit economics that you mentioned earlier, and that's a major reason why, you know, it, you know technical careers or quote unquote white collar jobs or, or, or skills are being replaced more quickly. I think there's also some other elements. I mean, it is still unit economics, but the first thing is physical infrastructure is difficult. To replace physical labor, you need to use physical infrastructure. And that is not as scalable as software is. Also, we've already created all the training data to replace ourselves because <laughs> GitHub exists. Yep. All these stock photo places exist to create all these images for the for mid-journey and, and stable diffusion and all these things. And by keeping good documentation, by doing all these things, we've sort of built the thing that will, in the long run, replace us. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Again, I don't think the long run is very soon. I don't think data scientists, my job, my work, my intuition is going to be replaced in the next couple of years. But that is something that is a little funny and paradoxical is that <laughs> by doing a good job, we've created all the fuel to light the fire that makes our work essentially somewhat replaceable. <laughs> That's true. I mean, we've we've been focusing on the algorithm for so long, we forgot the real the real big deal is the data. And we are the best creators and the best generators of high quality data. You know, you can think of a lot of what we've done as reinforcement learning with human feedback just unintentionally. So we've been building these data sets for over a decade now. The areas that have the highest coverage are the easiest to automate, but it's those low coverage areas. And what you'll find is that data about decision-making and the heuristics around decision-making, not a lot of data sets out there for that. Whereas the tasks, the doing, tons of data, and that'll translate robotics is coming around. We're going to see a chat GPT moment for robotics here in the next 18 months. So we'll see people replaced and it'll be those tasks. If you think about any surveillance camera or any place that has video equipment, that's the training data set. And it's the same idea. We're watching people do the work. But what's on the other side of that is decision making and discretion in some cases. For some jobs, there's very little. And those are going to be very easy to automate, like pulling boxes off of a shelf. I, I don't think we should have people doing that for very much longer. It's menial and it's almost, you know, to the point where it, it, it's disrespecting the person in a lot of ways. So I'm glad we're getting people out of those types of jobs. But at the same time, we're going to be challenged now. What is it from a decision-making standpoint that we haven't been creating data sets on? And that's where we're going to have to focus. But you'll also see in parity, companies trying to develop decision-focused data sets instead of task-focused data sets. And so there's almost this race to capture not only the tasks and the physical work, but also the decision-making behind it. But complex decision-making will always be within our realm. In my book, I talk about the who survives disruption, and there's three main people groups. We're not going to trust machines to lead people anytime soon. We may trust it to monitor people, but we won't trust it to lead people. Your domain experts, those people who understand some part of the decision chain that can't be automated. I call it irreducible complexity. It costs too much. And so it is something that people continue, or, or in some cases, really the technology just isn't there because there's a lot of that too. Now, the third group, obviously, is us, those people that are still creating this technology, maintaining the technology, uh, doing some of the advancements within the technology. So those are the groups that are going to survive disruption. And 
if most of your job is tasks, step one, step two, step three, and there's not much independent decision making, those are the jobs that are going to suffer the most from from automation. I think, you know, you, you sort of hit it in there, but it's interesting to think about when people get replaced. What are the factors that come into play? And I keep going back to the idea of unit economics or cost effectiveness. And I think the reason why we don't see, for example, more people who are pulling boxes being replaced with robotic infrastructure is because we haven't reached the break-even point on a quarterly basis for most companies. So something, you know, I'm sure this is a a thorn in your side, is that in large corporations, even medium-sized corporations, especially public ones, they're held at a quarterly standard. You're trying to hit quarterly numbers and keeping humans in the loop, especially for some tasks that, again, a robot could do, they probably could replace the humans right now, but it would be too expensive on a quarterly basis where they would lose money. And the funny thing to me is that if, you know, the company that makes that decision sooner and is able to, to tune the infrastructure even at a, a, an upfront cost that's lower, they get a longer tail. But the, the business environment that we live in and the reporting environment is something that holds back the technology, technological progress that, that we could be capitalizing on. And to, to me, that's just a, a wild concept. But I do think that that cutoff point where the unit economics makes sense on a quarterly level is a massive pivot point for any new technology. And the thing with, for example, ChatGPT is that it was pretty affordable right out of the gate and the unit economics made sense. Again, I think that's a little different because it is interfacing with jobs. I don't think ChatGPT can fully replace any one person's job unless you're like, hey, I'm using this person um, as a contract worker and they're specifically just making contracts for me or something along those lines. But um, I, I don't think people usually frame the pivot point in change based on when it's financially viable for companies. But I, I, that's a consideration. I'm not, I'm not sure why people don't evaluate more. No, you're totally right. Uh, but uh, what I think, this is another, you know, I'm, I'm kind of plugging my book, but it, it's relevant here. What people miss and what companies really miss is that you shouldn't do big bang initiatives where you say we're going to go from what we have right now, which could be an entirely manual process or something with a little bit of technology in it, to delivering an entirely automated solution that does everything you need it to. That doesn't work. You can't go straight from using digital technology to an AI solution for exactly the reason you said. The quarterly unit economics don't work, but you can deliver incrementally following a maturity scale where you move forward and you deliver value in six to eight week chunks. And you, instead of going directly to AI, you go through a progression of less expensive technologies And you deliver as much functionality as you can with the cheapest technology you can do it with. But at the same time, you're setting up for the next chunk. So it begins sort of as a larger initiative, but each delivery is six weeks, eight weeks. So you're delivering once or twice a quarter. You're delivering value on the schedule that business is needed on. And you're also, like I said, you're exhausting all of the potential from the least expensive technology possible and working your way towards more expensive technologies. So you're only using those for the functionality that you absolutely have to. And that's one way that you can make the unit economics work is following a maturity model, delivering incrementally, and really, you know, hold the big guns until you absolutely need to deploy the big guns. And what you'll find is each incremental chunk gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper because the decisions you make up front have amplifications. What you do next amplifies the value of what you started, but what you started also makes it less expensive to move to the next piece. And you can do that a lot with 
intelligent data gathering and data generation. So you're curating high quality data sets. Machine learning gets cheaper. The better the data, the cheaper the model is and the easier it is to use more advanced methods. And we're seeing that repeatedly in the research for generative methods. The better the data set that you start with, the smaller the model ends up being and the less amount of really the re lower resources to train and deploy the model. And you still get the same levels of reliability. So it's really setting up for later phases at the very beginning and delivering in chunks so the unit economics work. So what happens when that's inverted? So what I'm seeing now in the market is the big guns are actually becoming some of the cheapest things. If you think of large language models, it costs me less than a penny to hit the API of GPT three and a half, whatever it might be. Whereas historically, the big spend or the big infrastructure project that a company would do is they build a model similar to that. So now you go from having, oh, we've built up all this infrastructure and we just hit an API, we click a button basically, instead of building all of that, how does that transform that business environment? Or is it even transforming in that way? It, it is. You can, you can leapfrog. And I think it's brought some realism to the data world because it, Two years ago, companies were thinking they were going to build deep mind within their organization. Fortune 500 companies were hiring AI researchers and they had no business doing that. There was no, they weren't building these foundational models. And so they would really over hire. And McKinsey did a study where they, they showed that companies that had very few production deployments of machine learning valued data scientists and that researcher type of role more than any other. But the companies that had the most production deployments, they valued leadership, translator roles, and strategy roles. So they realized it isn't just a technology problem. When you look at what do we actually need in order to deliver value to customers, in order to make the, uh, make the business more efficient, you see it's a balancing act. It's not just a technology problem. There is this essential need to connect to value from the very beginning. And that's what's missing. Because when you do that, you begin to look at generative methods and you say, okay, I can hit an API, but so can everyone else. And so in six months, everyone's going to have the same, we're hitting the API. So what do you do to differentiate your company? from its competitors. What is it that's going to be your competitive advantage? And it turns out it's data. It isn't those foundational models. Businesses are going to be creating their own models, but they won't be, you know, that sort of deep mind AI research. They'll be using foundational models provided by other companies. So what are we going to be producing? That's, those are the competitive advantage initiatives. It's those models that are built on the business's unique access to data and the high quality data sets that it can curate lead to models that no one else can create. Once you adopt that paradigm, you know exactly why you've been building all this infrastructure. You know exactly why you have all these people. It's not the math. It's not the code. It is what the model can learn. And that's a sort of balancing act between the model itself and the data. What signal do you have in your data? And the majority of data today that's gathered with no business context, no customer context, there's so little signal in it that trying to build a model is, I mean, that's why you need so much of it. If it's all garbage, you need a whole lot of garbage in order to find signal. And that's one of the biggest challenges that companies are facing is it's inefficient. And that's why the unit economics don't work for so many projects. But if you start with the data and you curate it properly, if you control and then eventually engineer your data generating processes, you're going to be successful because that's the competitive advantage. I think that is such a paradigm shift for so many people. I, I personally love it is that we're incrementally improving this 
so that when the model that we're not going to build, but is super high quality or maybe not high quality, super valuable based on our data is out there, we can implement it as quickly as possible. And that's where the, the, the surplus comes from. I'm, I'm interested in the downside of that though. So yes, there, there probably isn't a downside to improving your quality of data and your infrastructure, but what is the downside to outsourcing to these multi-purpose large language models that are owned by someone else other than you? I mean, there's probably a lot that come to mind, but what are what's what's one maybe that is unconventional that we might not think of? Well, I think especially with open source, if we don't understand the training data set, we're opening ourselves up to liability. And I've seen multiple regulations that not only hold the you know the organization that built it liable, but also if you integrate it into your product, there may be some component of liability. So open source is amazing. And I think we need to continue to move open source models and open source AI forward. We need to do it in a way that it's not just enough to throw it out there with the, you know, the open source license and to say, oh yeah, you can use this for personal or commercial use. You also need some way to protect the business and protect from liability. And that's both sides because open source creators are liable for damage done based on the model just as much as companies are. So there's sort of this aligned interest. And I think that's the that's one of the sleeper trends is we're looking at open AI and we're saying, oh yeah, you know, they're they're liable for this training data and for any potential infringement. But what most people don't realize is if they have to take their APIs down as a result of this, or if they have to degrade the performance of their APIs as a result of their liability, everything built on top of that is also going to suffer directly or indirectly. House of cards. And we also don't know what the liability component of that is. You know, if you've been running a, a product on OpenAI's model and OpenAI is found liable, does that liability extend to you? And if you're working with one of the hyperscalers like AWS or Microsoft, they're giving their customers a shield, you know, really a liability shield by saying, yeah, we got this. If you're working with us, we're protecting you. But if you're just using open source or if you're connecting directly to a startup, you may not have that same shielding. Liability is a very interesting thing to me, especially right now. So I'm, I'm reading this book called the woke Inc. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it talks a lot about how if I, as an individual CEO push a specific agenda, that's relevant to me, it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you are. I'm technically protected by my company from individual liability, and I can use that company as a vehicle to push whatever things that I believe into the market. Should an individual have that much power to influence people and also have the protection of an LLC or an S Corp or whatever it might be to do that? And to me, that's really interesting in this frame is, okay, let's say open AI has, or someone at open AI has an agenda, they can build in whatever it might be into, into the technology, they're able to influence millions and millions of people. Whereas someone who's creating this open source, and I'd have to look into the legality and what protections people actually have, if I just produce it not through an LLC and it's being heavily used and all this crazy stuff, and then someone uses it for bad, and then I'm individually liable, that's a terrifying thing is people can come after everything that I own in some sense. Whereas Sam Altman, they can not touch any of his individual finances at all, except for maybe equity that he has within OpenAI. And to me, that dynamic, one, something I'd never thought of before, but it is kind of a negative incentive for people to produce things in an open source environment. And I think that something around that needs to change. I don't know exactly what, because I would like to see more positive incentives for people to produce open source. Um, but you know, at the same time, there is some positive to that because I think there should be checks and balances um, in what these technologies are, are used for. But it is such a gray area and that's just another wrinkle that 
that I'm picking up on now that's being added to this entire complicated equation. Yeah, and it's it's like medical malpractice. Doctors don't go out and intend to do harm. But sometimes when you're dealing with uncertainty, which, you know, patient care, there's a lot of uncertainty. When you're dealing with uncertainty, even if you're acting in good faith and doing something that you're trained well to do, you can still make mistakes. And it's a, it's a larger question. It's the same thing with open source. You can be acting in good faith, doing your best, using your expertise to, to develop something amazing. And we have to figure out a way to protect people who are not negligent from a professional standard, but there could be a finding of negligence by legal standards. So we need to find ways to protect individuals in the same way that people that own companies are protected. Like I am personally shielded by my company. I get to do a lot that other people would have significant liability over. And I just have to buy insurance. You know, that's a, that's, that's kind of a, a big shield, but from any other perspective, it, it's dangerous to do open source. So you're right. We need to incentivize. And we used to do our sort of knowledge dynamism. We used to distribute knowledge through academia, through government organizations where DOD would do research and then release it publicly. And that's how we got the internet. We used to have think tanks and research arms within large universities. They would be funded publicly as well as by state and federal. And then what they learned, what they discovered would be made openly available. That was where open source started. And with those guidelines, those people working on advancements were protected. Through their university, institution, whatever it might be. Now we've reduced the cost of making discoveries. We've reduced the level of effort required to make discoveries. And we've made a means of publication more openly accessible to more people. That's really, really good, but we haven't created frameworks that catch up with the technology paradigm, which is a problem. (laughs) We do that a lot, don't we? We we don't really think it through. We release it and then we find out what's wrong and we try to band-aid it after the fact. It doesn't seem like it works very well. So we need to be in front of more of these types of challenges instead of continually catching up. So what you described there, I think for most people is essentially the doomsday scenario. So we build something and we don't think about the consequences and then it essentially bites us in the butt, the Terminator, mm-hmm. effectively. Yeah. Um, some other people think the doomsday scenario is someone creates an open source package and bad actors use it to create dis- discourse, unrest, whatever it might be in the world. What do you think a realistic Terminator scenario looks like rather than necessarily robots coming and attacking us from the future? <laughs> I, for one, welcome. If our robot overlords are listening to this podcast, I, for one, welcome you. Thank you. Um, uh, we're kind of waiting to be saved. And there's I say been some thank you in all my chat GPT prompts. So yes. Yeah. I, I, I try to be nice to uh, all virtual agents because you never know which one's the one, but, it, it, and you know, as much as I'm joking about it, it, there's some reality to that. Eventually one of these will evolve to the point where we can't control every component of its behavior. And I think that's where right now we're at a point where everything we've built from a technology standpoint is contained. The closest we've ever gotten to something that's an uncontained dangerous technology is nuclear weapons. Because those, but those have a level of complexity. You need the raw materials and you need some significant know-how in order to develop them. The barrier to developing advanced machine learning is coming down so fast that we're now seeing people in college, you know, midway through their undergrad, developing leading edge models and leveraging open source data sets to do it. 
figuring out novel approaches that reduce the hardware footprint requirements, that reduce level of really domain expertise required, reduce the amount of data that's necessary. So we're going to see that continue to come down and come down quick because optimization's inevitable. It costs too much right now. When you look at how much NVIDIA is selling chips for as they're about to release their earnings, it's, it is a staggering amount of money that it costs in order to train these large models. So optimization is inevitable, and that ties into the Terminator because it gets cheaper and cheaper every year. And the knowledge required every year to build a, you know, an RC car with a handgun on it comes down every year. And if you put a GoPro and, you know, a pistol on top of an RC car, train it with a facial recognition algorithm, you can start telling it, hey, go to this person's house and take them out. Like the Please level of... Just for clarity. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not recommending anyone do that, but I'm just saying that level of knowledge continues to come down. It gets easier and easier to do. And so that's the, that's where, you know, if I'm looking at the Terminator, it is that we can weaponize it more and, you know, with at lower and lower cost, lower and lower domain expertise, you throw 3D printing into this. And now we have, we're giving people access to specifications for anything. And so robotics applications come into play here. And so we are losing control of it because it is no longer contained. The technology is too easy. It's too accessible. And people are smart. There is an open and available knowledge store. And with generative AI, it's even more available. So the costs of this are coming down. And that's one of my worries. But the other worry is that if you make a model that's sufficiently, not intelligent, but you know, I'm, I'm overextending the word. It has sufficient domain expertise. You can throw it at a marketplace and destabilize the marketplace. So it isn't so much doing something intentionally wrong. It's somebody decides that they want to trade on the stock market and throws a model at it, but they're not thinking all the way through the implications of what happens when you throw that model. And think about Wall Street bets and the short squeezes where they almost destabilized the market on Reddit. If you can mobilize enough people, you can begin to destabilize markets by finding flaws in the market, by finding weaknesses in the marketplace. And that's what models really do well. They learn the rules of these very complex seeming systems. But if you give them enough data, they're actually not that complex. And models are so much faster than we are that if you put an algorithmic trading system out on one of the one of the exchanges and it was smart enough, it was good enough, it would begin to eventually destabilize the market. And so while we're all thinking about RC cars with pistols on this side as the big danger, no, the, the danger really is that somebody in their 20s who's studied economics and has figured a few things out creates a model that's sufficiently accurate enough or sufficiently reliable enough that it destabilizes a marketplace. That's the really big danger because think about that. It, you know, Reddit got close. It wasn't a true destabilization, but they got close enough to show what can happen if you can get enough people believing in a system. And if they had more people they would have truly destabilized a large segment of the market and more than one hedge fund would have collapsed. And you can start a cascade that way. You can inadvertently, as we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, you can inadvertently start bank runs. You, all of these things now, these complex marketplaces and systems, they're vulnerable to models. And in my opinion, that's the Terminator, is someone who's really smart has absolutely no malice in them. They're just building something to do algorithmic trading or to optimize the spot price of some agricultural good or to I mean, just, you know, really benign uses. But the model itself, the accuracy of it and a community that gets behind it 
can destabilize a number of different marketplaces. And somebody who's not trying to create the Terminator and who doesn't create anything that's that intelligent just inadvertently destabilizes something that society depends on. Interesting. I, I think, you know, it, it seems like you're saying the Terminator is not some sentient AI. The Terminator is us in some non-purposeful way, but in a somewhat selfish way, because the pursuit of profit or any of these types of things are inherently selfish. I, I see it actually almost the opposite, which, I, which I'd love to get your take on. I believe that it will not be an individual or a group of communities. I think it will be companies in pursuit of profit that will likely destabilize everything. I mean, you look at, for example, BlackRock, the company that owns probably the largest amount of assets all over the world. AI allows them to do things that the individual investor cannot. Like BlackRock, for example, is getting heavily into residential real estate. And that makes it so that individuals like myself, it's difficult to buy a house. Like I, I do pretty well financially, virtually impossible for me to afford a house, a, you know, not an apartment, a house in Hawaii. Um, and the perpetuation of these models mean that BlackRock, large companies can monopolize these markets without necessarily breaking any laws. And it, you know, it, it essentially creates this snowball going downhill that gains more and more momentum. And I think you might see that in the stock market as well, is that as part of our portfolio, it's probably more likely that a hedge fund creates one of these models that creates unlimited upside for them and crashes the market, because then they're technically winning even more. Um, and they also have the scale and the volume and the resources and the people to enact on that. I think that absolutely it's possible that an individual or a movement could completely destabilize things. I think it has to essentially be a movement. Um, but I, I think we can recover from a, a movement that breaks things fundamentally uh, easier than if a large corporation or a, a big player in a space takes a massive grab out of it. Because one thing I do realize about AI and technology is one, there's uneven access. And I think uneven access perpetuates inequality. So what are your kind of thoughts on, on that perspective as well? I think uneven access is decreasing because when you look at the cost of a laptop, you know, and what people are training from an LLM standpoint on laptops now is it, it's kind of crazy. And the reason why I think it's an individual, not a company is because with a company, you have unlimited resources, especially when you're talking about hedge funds. They will continue to throw as much into it as you can make with it. So if you increase the revenue by 25%, your budget for the data team is going to increase by 20 or 25%. So you're going to, as much as you're effective, you will continually also get more resources. And that's not necessarily a good thing because innovation doesn't thrive in abundance. Innovation thrives because of scarcity. And if you don't have enough compute resources, you are forced to figure out that optimization. You're forced to innovate. Whereas if you have a ton of money, you're just siphoning data as fast and as much as you can and sort of perpetuating the same type of model because there's no, I mean, why innovate? Why disrupt? Why not simply take the incremental gains that you can that you can get? They're available. They're cheap. It's simple. Why not just keep going? You know, it's the, it's the old saying, if you're continuing to grow 25% every year, the street's not going to be unhappy. If that's what you're able to do every year, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep going that way. And so that's when you look at a company, companies that are successful with AI will be growth engines. And so they're going to continue to push cash into their, their data organizations. You saw that at Meta, saw it at Google, and it will continue. Amazon had it too. And then they started cutting back and they realized, wait, we cut back a ton of staff and we actually became more productive. So they've, there's a lot of companies that understand that. So the optimization comes from, I have a laptop and access to a free Amazon account or a free Azure account. That's all I got. 
and I have a tenth of the data that I actually need. So you have to innovate. That's why I think it is the individual or the small group, the ones with a small number of really constrained resources. And you're also seeing this in cybersecurity, where you're seeing people that are coming from poor neighborhoods, getting online, learning cybersecurity. And they're not only, you know, it used to be they were the greatest, they were the best cyber criminals, but now, like, they're the top cybersecurity experts. And it's out of necessity. They had to figure it out. And they had to do a little bit of a harder road, but they realized you know, if I want to get a better life for myself, this is one way I can do it. So you're going to see that same ingenuity propel, I think, individuals faster because those barriers keep coming down. And in the next few years, it will be almost an advantage to be a small company that can't get funding, that has to innovate in order to solve these complex problems. I, I think it's it's really fascinating because there's good case studies in both directions, right? You talk about Wall Street bets, essentially, you know, teetering on well, making hedge funds lose a huge amount of money. But there's also flash crashes where hedge funds or algorithmic trading firms do something wrong. They essentially lose all their money overnight, but they, they could cause a massive shock to the system. Um, something that you really touched on but I would love more insight around is that right now it seems like all innovation in AI is coming from volume, economies of scale, and inefficiency. We're just throwing more and more data at things. In some sense, it's reverting a little bit with Llama and the open source models. But the biggest innovations from large language models overall, I think people will agree, come from the amount and volume of data that's collected. And that does sort of touch on what you were describing before is that data is the most valuable asset to, to build these things around. But do you see, I mean, it seems like you see a trend in the market going the opposite direction where, in, where efficiency will be something that will be at a premium. How, how do we go from huge scale? I mean, you're talking about the ability to buy a laptop for cheap. Compute is cheaper than ever. Uh, there's a lot of things going for just increasing volume and getting better systems that, that way. I mean, that, that's one thing why I see it is difficult, uh, why I would see it would be difficult for an individual to disrupt in such a way, because all of the innovation, at least right now, seems to be going uh, to be happening because of massive volume and economies of scale. Well, think about how many people have been laid off. That's where I want to a lot of sort of people. think about the level of intelligence right now that's wandering around available. Think about how many people are still at these large companies who are disillusioned, who are, you know, they bought in five, seven, 10 years ago to big tech, big family. We do things differently out here in the Valley, or we do things differently out here in, you know, pick your country or pick your region. And then they realized that it was the same old, same old. And so we have talent that's trapped in jobs they want out of. And we have talent that's been laid off that doesn't want to play the game anymore. So that's the talent component. We have companies like NVIDIA that are, if you want to fuel, basically, if you want to run workloads, you need some of their chips and there is scarcity around getting access to them. It's one of the reasons why Apple has created Apple Silicon. They realized they were not going to put their business in the hands of someone else. And so they developed Apple Silicon because Intel had a little bit too much control and Qualcomm had a little bit too much control and ARM had a little. Too so now they have more control over their business. But other companies are going to have that same epiphany where they realize you know, especially if you're a car manufacturer, when you saw that there was a shortage of silicon, you realized that was constraining your ability to deliver. You couldn't hit your numbers because you couldn't source this one part. And that's scarcity because we're scaling up and it's going to only get bigger. When you think about what IoT is going to do over the next five years, demand isn't going down. It's about to explode. 
when I talk about that robotics, uh, you know, the next, the chap GPT moment for robotics, that requires vision. And so that's a whole lot more data. That's a whole lot more compute intensive to do computer vision models. So going from language to computer vision, if you think language takes a lot of compute, computer vision is another, like that's on another level. And so you're yeah, talking about a thousand words, right? Yeah, it's just nuts how much storage space video takes up. And even with as smart as we've gotten with compression, it still takes up a lot. So you're looking at all of these forces. You've got talent and they're looking for new, innovative, fulfilling. They're looking to create environments where they can do what they thought they were going to be able to do in big tech. You're seeing large problems that can't be solved by simply linearly scaling silicon or by linearly scaling the amount of data that we throw at a model or using the same type of modeling approaches. You're seeing us hit limits where we can't scale fast enough to meet demand. And so we have a significant need and driver for innovating and we have talent. And I think when those two get together, we'll see disruption happen. I think we'll see the end of silicon because it's not efficient. It's And when you look at rare earths, that's just inefficient. And I think that's one of the really interesting things that this superconductor sort of boom bust will do is it will make all of us revisit simpler materials and ask ourselves, have we missed something? there's there's probably a whole lot cheaper ways to do the things that we're doing today. And we've simply required, you know, just said, this is the way that we're doing it now and we can scale it up. So why not just keep scaling? But then when you hit boundaries, that's when innovation's forced. And so we have the talent, we have the problems and we are running up against those boundaries where there's enough money and solutions to potentially drive an innovation forward. So I think we see something come forward and replace silicon. I think we see quantum computing show up faster than most people are estimating it to because there's enough of a need. So you're, what you're suggesting is it seems like we're pushing up against the theor- theoretical limits. Right? Essentially, there's only so many transistors you could fit on a chip. And if they're the size of atoms, they can't get any smaller. I mean, obviously, they'd have to be multiple atoms, but but you get the idea. And so, for example, the the solution to that was having multiple cores, having distributed computing and those types of things. But those are not exponentially scalable, like, for example, quantum computing would be. Is that roughly the, okay. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that it's also something that companies are going to have to be thinking about as they grow and expand I think that this is a really good time to touch on the book. You know, like what type of book did you set out to make? And then what did it actually <laughs> end up becoming? It's funny. I I wanted this to be a for everyone book. And I think I, I, sort of, I realized it near the end and I was, I was deluding myself a little bit, but I wrote a strategy book and I wrote a book that's a single playbook for businesses that are serious about profiting from disruptive technology. I meant to write a book about data and AI, and I really wrote a book about how do you monetize technology? How do you manage continuous transformation, seeing as technology is just continuing to move forward? So transformation is no longer one time. And that changes everything about business strategy. It changes everything about the competitive nature of marketplaces. And like we've touched on, I mean, you're seeing different forces come forward. Assumptions that businesses are built on and that strategy is built on have been disrupted. So what I intended to write was sort of the the book for everyone that explained how do you monetize data and AI. What I ended up writing was a strategy book for redefining a modern firm or building an efficient firm from the ground up that was built to monetize each one of these waves. And I 
I, I wrote a book that really redefined strategy as something that incorporates data science, that incorporates advanced models, that instead of being disrupted by it, brought all of these strategies supposed to be forward-looking and prescriptive. That's what models do. Strategy is supposed to be a framework for decision-making that unites the firm. Well, models support that too. You begin to see that with data science, strategy is a completely different uh, in every way. So I meant to write a book about something smaller and I ended up writing a book about something much bigger. And the timing of it is really interesting because I think now generative AI has built the case to support a lot of what the book explains and builds frameworks to manage. So if you use the frameworks for your generative AI strategy, you're going to see the power. And you'll see the reason why they're necessary, not just for generative AI, but for every technology wave going forward. So I meant to write something small and I realized I didn't really do that. I wrote something bigger than I expected. So I'm interested. Did you have to rewrite any of the book with generative <laughs> AI in mind times. or did you just <laughs> nail it and say, oh, I got it right. Generative AI fits in perfect. Oh, uh, no. I, I don't know how Wiley didn't, you know, send somebody out here with a baseball bat to take me out. I I started writing it in uh, really the end of November, beginning of December uh, 2022. You know, not much happened <laughs> in December, January, and February. You know, it's slow months for, for data science. <laughs> and generative AI created use cases and case studies. And it, it created the body of proof I needed to explain more advanced constructs. So I kept rewriting and adding chapters and updating. And we finally got to March and Wiley cut me off. You know, I was like a bad drunk. They said, you're done. You can't write anymore. This was supposed to be a 250 page book. It's 350 pages. Stop. You're done. And they cut me off. And the problem was I had to put uh, you know, end of March is when really everything cut off. The book wasn't going to release until the middle of July. So I had to put statements into the book that were forward looking. I was talking about features, functionality models that hadn't been released yet, but I knew they would be released. And progress was moving so fast. I had to write a book as if I was writing it in July, even though I was writing it back in March. And it was a tremendous challenge to put things in so that when it released, it wasn't obsolete, that it was still relevant in July, even though I hadn't written anything for it for over four months. It was, yeah, it was interesting. And I'm amazed Wiley put up with me for the entire time instead, <laughs> instead of just well, taking me out. You know, that is one of the biggest problems with books is that they're effectively static unless you do a revision in a year, second edition, third edition, whatever that might be. I know that you're solving that problem in a pretty unique way with the newsletter and and re-education. Can you tell me more about that as well? Yeah, there, I have a newsletter on Substack. I've got classes and they're living because Really what you said, if you teach the same class for a semester, by the time you get to the end of the semester, if you haven't updated the material continuously, it's obsolete. So if you're teaching for three months and you're not rebuilding every month, by the time you get to that last month, it is, it, and that's how fast data and machine learning and data science and AI are moving. So the book itself really stands alone. And it's luckily I, I got most of it right and it's good, but we're going to have to do a re-release. The Substack newsletter also supports the book in that it allows me to number one, dive deeper, write a lot of the things that Wiley told me, if you keep writing, we will take you out. And so the newsletter is sort of my way of extending it. And I've got a book reading group that allows me to provide some color and context. I hold that once a week. The courses are deeper dives into frameworks, implementations of frameworks. And the thing I love about the courses, 
is the workshop element of it where I get to actually work with students and build and do and implement each one of these. But I also get to update the case studies. And there have been days where, you know, in my last cohort, I was rebuilding slides 20 minutes before class time because something happened that day that was just an excellent case study. And so I, I don't know that I could ever publish anything if it wasn't living, if I wasn't able to continuously update it. So that's been been really interesting and also sort of a relief that I can add the color and the context and everything else and keep the the content fresh and meaningful. Amazing. You know, Ben, I have one last question that I added in sort of at the end. Uh, in, and I, I'm interested. Obviously, you're experiencing rapid change in, in AI and how it's thought about conceptually. You're experiencing a lot of change in your personal life with the book and the type of work that you're doing, the business that's coming in. How has all of this overall change uh, impacted your personal values? Have they stayed the same? Is there something that you've had to rethink? I think going from macro and these big things that are changing in the world to, to how they affect us individually is a very powerful sentiment. You know, I don't think it has. And at the core of what I do and who I am, technology doesn't really impact that because I can just put it all down and walk away from it. And that's one of the nice things about where I live. Living in Northern Nevada, if you drive for 35, 45 minutes in any direction, you can forget technology exists. All you see is phone lines, you know, and that's against the backdrop of the Gigafactory and one of Amazon's largest distribution centers and data centers for Google and Meta. So it's not like it's a backwards region, but there's just so much empty space that I'm able to sort of recenter because you can get lost in all this technology. And I think that's really where you're going with that question is it's really easy to lose yourself. I found that on social media a long time ago, that if you believe your own hype, you're in trouble. If you believe what everyone says about you and all the good things that you get written about you or all the bad things that get written about you. Yeah. If you go into either one of those rabbit holes, you lose complete perspective on who you really are. And so it's important to be able to put all of that down and look at the reality of what's in front of you. Look at the, you know, especially for me, it's family. And it is the place that I live and people that I have strong connections to. That's real. The technology makes that better. It makes it easier. And I try to make my life uh, sort of revolve around tangible wealth instead of the sort of intangible or ephemeral types of wealth. And that's been helping. So, so far, I mean, outside of overworking myself and making some, some good decisions and some bad decisions, I, I think that's about, you know, not a lot of big impacts, big changes, but personally, not a lot of big impacts. I think that that's such an Im important concept you brought up there is that all of this stuff is happening very fast. You know, if you're, you view yourself, oh, I'm a data scientist, that's who I am. And in 10 years, the role of data science completely changes or your life completely changes or any of these things have th this dramatic impact in the swirling technology environment. That's not very grounding. And you're going to be, you know, swept around every different way. And it's going to be very unsettling. I think that in light of all this rapid change for companies, for roles, for CEOs, for AI, for whoever it might be, it's really important to sort of distance yourself from that as well. You can be immersed in it and and involved in it, but you don't have to be it. And that's that's something that I, I took out of what you were saying there. And I, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you are not your job. You're not the technology. There's something bigger there. And it's almost tying back to generative AI and having to differentiate what it is about you that makes you uniquely human. It's the same thing with a personality. <laughs> you need something that's uniquely human, not connected to your job or your company or your education or, you know, something that can be taken away. Amazing. I think that's a perfect thing to end on. Everyone listening, let me know what makes you uniquely human. 
Then if you are, I mean, you know, maybe we, maybe we got some. <laughs> Good point. I'll ask ChatGPT that question later. Yep. Um, With all respect to the uh, non-human entities that are watching the show today. <laughs> precisely. That's a consideration we're going to have to make too. Then. Uh, uh, obviously a pleasure speaking to, with you. How can people learn more, reach out, whatever it might be? Uh, where can they find the book as well? Yeah. Thanks for, th- thank you for having me. Thank you for, you know, giving me the opportunity to talk to all of your followers. Uh, datascience.vin. Everything that you want to know about me is at datascience.vin. And, uh, you know, huge shout out to the French wine industry for naming a domain after me. Great. You know, that worked out really nicely. Appreciate that. Yeah. Good on them. And on you, apparently. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Everyone check out from data to profit. Also check out uh, data science.vin.